recap. We had talked about last time. Uh, any questions from you guys? Okay. Uh, we had talked about uh, last time uh, our full interaction model. So, and again, uh, the example that we had here, we actually have a little bit complicated because we have two interactive effects in here, right? Uh, we've got an interaction of opiate, uh, opioid use and pain, uh, which we uh, identified as looking at uh, the impact of opiate use on the relation between uh, pain severity and uh, functioning. And then we have an interaction of pain and PTSD, which we conceptualize as looking at the impact of pain severity on the relation between PTSD and functioning, right? So uh, again, our questions, what was the impact of pain severity on the relationship between, or in the relation between PTSD and neural functioning? What's the impact of opiate medication on the relation between physical and pain control function? So we've got a couple of different uh, interactive terms in this, right? Uh, if we're going to diagram these, right? So this is often how we would diagram those moderating effects. Again, highlighting the fact that what we're looking at is some third variable impacting the nature of the relation between some base association here, right? Again, thinking about moderation as asking the question, under what conditions uh, does this association hold? Right? What are the boundary uh, conditions? What factors start to change the nature of the relation between X and Y? Okay. So we talked about uh, how to go through and restructure uh, mathematically, just basic algebra, taking your regression model and start to restructure to look at uh, your simple slopes. Uh, so we go through and we take down our uh, constant uh, for this model when we're looking at the relation between uh, the impact of pain on PTSD and functioning. Opiate use is a part of this, so we can bring this down. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to get gather up terms related to uh, our conditional effects. In this case, we've got a conditional, we're conceptualizing this as a conditional effect of pain and a conditional effect of PTSD, right? Conditional effects in that in the presence of a significant interaction, right? The relation between pain and uh, functioning depend, or PTSD and functioning depends on pain. And in the presence of a significant interaction, uh, the relation between pain and functioning depends on opiate use, right? Uh, so we bring down our conditional effects, and then we just start going through and packing in terms. So I go through and I grab uh, any of the uh, terms that have pain in them. So we've got pain and opiate use and pain. There's pain and PTSD, but that's going to a different conditional effect. So we've got pain, opiate use and pain, drop this down, drop that down, do the same thing for pain or for PTSD, making sure we're carrying our signs down so that we don't sort of get turned around. You'll do this, this will happen, try not to, but if you find that things aren't adding up the way that you would want them to, take a look at your signs, make sure that you've got those carried down correctly. Uh, and then what we can do with our restructured equation here, we can very clearly see that the coefficient that we get for pain uh, the relation between pain and functioning is going to depend on the value we plug in there for opiate use, right? Uh, depending on what value opiate use takes on, that's going to start to impact the coefficient, uh, indicating the uh, unique association of pain and outcome, uh, and functional outcome. Same thing here, we see that uh, illustrating the conditional effect of PTSD in that the value that we plug in for pain, that person's pain score, is going to start to impact and change the uh, value of this coefficient looking at the unique relation between PTSD uh, and outcome here, okay? Um, and so we can see here that the effect of pain is conditioned on opiate use, the effect of PTSD is dependent on, uh, on, on physical pain, um, and so uh, if these interaction terms are statistically significant, we're saying that these effects now are not main effects, these are conditional effects. I can't tell you what the unique uh, uh, relation of pain with outcome is unless I know the value of PTSD, right? or opiate use, things along these lines. Okay, so it's just like the way we were thinking about our multiplicative uh, animal models previously. Okay, just bringing things back, people kind of in the right mindset now on this. Okay, cool. So with our simple slopes, remember what we did is we took our restructured equation and then just started plugging in high and low values, right? Uh, this is just basic algebra. Uh, if we want to look at uh, the relation between uh, PTSD and uh, functioning at high levels of pain, we take our restructured equation, we go through and drop out opiate use, because if we plug zero into opiate use, zero into opiate use, those go away, give us down here, uh, we go through and we want to say uh, at high pain, high pain takes on a value of uh, 1.34, the 
in our centered uh, variable. Remember, this is just a standard deviation above and below. We plug 1.34 in for our values of pain. Gives us our simple slope, looking at the conditional effect of PTSD on outcome, right? At high levels of pain. Same thing we did, the same thing for low pain. Just gonna jump ahead, take the same equation we got there. Now, instead, we're gonna substitute uh, values for low pain, which is a standard deviation below the mean of zero, negative 1.34, drop those in, and this is gonna give us our conditional effect of PTSD at low levels of pain, okay? Um, same thing with opiate use. We have our full equation, go down through. We're holding PTSD constant at zero, so that takes care of that term. Uh, so we've got, uh, here's our reduced equation. We go through and we're looking at the conditional effect of pain on outcome uh, at, for people who aren't using opiates in our data set, negative 0.5 is uh, the value uh, that, that take, we take for people without opiate use. Plug in negative 0.5, negative 0.5 gives us the conditional effect of pain on functioning for people not taking opiates. And then the same thing with opiate, uh, for people who are using opiate use, take our same equation here, drop in 0 0.5, 0 0.5 right here for indicating people who are taking opiates, gives us our conditional effect of pain on uh, functioning for individuals who are taking opiates, right? And what we see is this, uh, uh, this um, coefficient for pain changes, right, across these. We don't get this with our additive model, only for our models where we have uh, interaction, interactive effects. Uh, note, however, that our uh, sort of want to make, be sure that we've got properly specified models. All the, these models that we walked through are fine, unless we have uh, a three-way interaction in which um, PTSD moderates uh, the two-way interaction of uh, pain and opiate use. If we have a three-way interaction, then all of our stuff is biased and questionable, right? Um, we, in this model, have just gone through and said we've got two interactions that we're interested in, and so we just modeled those two, uh, but we don't have a full factorial model. Full factorial model here would include a combination of opiate use and pain, uh, interaction of opiate use and pain, and then it would have the three-way interaction uh, structure in there, right? Now, uh, in terms of thinking about should we have included those in the model? Maybe, right? Um, if those interactions make sense, always, always, always ask yourself, if this thing comes up, could I explain it, right? Uh, this will help you from having factorial models with like seven-way interactions and things like that. What would you do if that actually turned up? Could you explain it? Would it make theoretical sense, right? Is there a way to talk about this? And if not, you probably shouldn't have it in your model because if it comes up, you're gonna be stuck explaining it. And if it doesn't make any sense, then you've got a whole couple of pages of talking about speculative stuff that probably doesn't make any sense. Uh, it might just be a, an artifact of, of your set, right? So uh, always remember, going back to our basic assumptions, uh, our uh, coefficients are only as good as the specification of our model. So one, you think, could I, could OB use impact the relation between PTSD and functioning? Potentially, I mean, I could see maybe Right. I mean, if that came up, I could probably come up with some reason. I wouldn't have to stretch things too far, right? A three-way interaction of pain and opiate use and function, that might be, right? But these are the types of things we need to think about and consider as we're putting together our models. Okay. So we went through, uh, we uh, took a look at our simple slopes, right? Uh, talked about, so here we see that uh, the association between pain and uh, and uh, functioning is stronger for people who have no opi or who are not taking opiate medications as opposed to those people who are, right? Which kind of makes some sense, right? If these pain drugs are doing what they should be doing, I should have a stronger relation between pain and functioning for people who aren't taking these medications as opposed to those who are. It's not a it's not a huge difference, but it's sort of looking like that's kind of what's going. Right here, uh, we're seeing uh, an interaction of uh, pain and PTSD. And we can conceptualize this as pain moderating the relation between PTSD and functioning. Uh, in that, for uh, people with low levels of pain, we see uh, decent 
uh, negative relation between uh, PTSD and functioning as PTSD symptoms increase. We see a decrease in functioning. Uh, however, uh, if we look at people with high levels of pain, we see basically what looks like no coefficients positive, but it looks like no association between uh, PTSD and functioning at high levels of pain. Someone help me understand what's what's going on here. Why, why are we, this one kind of makes sense. What's going on here? see our expected values uh, of functioning, our expected values of functioning actually are, are less than zero, which we talk about as being, we've also got values that we can't have values less than zero, and this starts to become problematic, right? Part of this is because we've got a wonky rural functioning is not a good outcome. But, yeah, exactly right, right? If I have low levels of pain, if my PTSD gets worse, my function gets worse. If I'm intense physical pain, it doesn't matter what my PTSD levels are. Right? The physical pain is trumping my functioning. If I'm at high levels of pain, it doesn't matter what my level of PTSD is, I'm just below the floor in terms of overall functioning. Right? So this starts to become very important. Right? We don't just like plot these out and say this is a relationship between X and Y. Uh, wanting to think very carefully about what this means, how do we understand these moderation effects. Okay. And so then we, uh, and we've gone through uh, handouts and things like that look at, at how we had uh, constructed our interaction effects and centered everything uh, and how we actually got this in SPSS, right? Um, so this is a, a, a lot of, as I talked about how to go through and plot these, it takes us to this point where we stopped, or people kind of comfortable at this point, questions on sort of any of these processes. Okay, so, one of the things, so this is, so with our main, our overall model, right? This is just our model with our interactive effects of PTSD and pain and opiate use and PTSD. We can go through, and in this model, based on the output from SPSS, we can get a sense for uh, how much of the variability of my outcome is accounted for by my uh, lower order effects and my higher order effects, or my interaction effects. I can go through and I can say whether or not my interaction terms are statistically significant. I can take that regression model and I can go through and factor that down and I can uh, determine what the simple slope is uh, at each one of my high and low levels of my moderator. I can plot out those simple slopes. I can do almost everything very easily just based on that sort of overall my primary regression model, right? But what I can't do is I can't test the statistical significance of my simple slopes at whatever sort of level I, I, I want to look at. And again, typically, this is a standard deviation above and below, right? And this starts to become important because, as I think Nick noted, maybe, maybe it wasn't, maybe Nick's getting credit for something somebody else did. I've got a positive coefficient right here, right? Uh, where technically, if I'm looking at this, based on the point estimate of my coefficient, uh, it's looking like um, PTSD severity holds a positive association with role functioning at high levels of pain, suggesting that as PT, my PTSD severity gets worse, my functioning increases if I have high levels of pain, right? Which doesn't make a lot of sense. So what I might want to do, now, if I'm looking at this, I'm, that's a near flat line, right? So I'm not going to be too concerned in this situation, but there could be situations where I am, right? I'm getting effects, and so what I might want to know is, does PTSD hold a reliable association with role functioning at high levels of pain? Does it hold a reliable association with role functioning at low levels of pain? I want to see, are these simple slopes, are these statistically reliable, are these different than zero, right? And so if I want to go through and test the, uh, uh, the significance of my simple slopes, I don't have a way to run a, a, a hypothesis test on these just based on my over the coefficients provided in my overall model. I can't test 
to see whether uh, my conditional effect is statistically reliable at high and low levels with my moderator, right? Um, so again here, uh, relation of PTSD of functioning at high and low levels of pain, positive relationship. What I need is a strategy to say, okay, at high levels of pain or high levels of my moderator or low levels of my moderator, do I have a statistically significant relation at high and low levels? And so what I can do is I can go through and I can start to moderate or modify my statistical model to go through and actually test this, all right? And this is where it starts to become very, very important in understanding what zero means in this model and how my models go through, going through and, and testing stuff, okay? So let's say we're going back to this, right? I want to know what's the impact of pain severity uh, or what's the impact of pain severity on the relation between PTSD and role function, right? I can get my simple slope, I can sort of get that out of the main model, but I can't test uh, uh, whether or not that's reliable, okay? And so what I can do, though, is I can start to rescale the zero point on my moderator, right? What I can start to do is change where this model is assessing the relation between PTSD uh, and pain, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through in SPSS and I'm gonna create two new variables uh, that's going to correspond to these variables of my moderator, in this case pain. It's gonna change what zero means in terms of uh, on that scale, right? And so my first one, I'm gonna create a variable where my zero point corresponds with high levels of pain, and I'm gonna create another uh, variable called low pain, and the zero point on that variable is gonna uh, be consistent with uh, low levels of pain. Now what's tricky with this, and counterintuitive, to get my high pain value, I'm going to subtract a standard deviation uh, to recenter this, my pain variable, so that the zero corresponds to high pain, and for low pain, I'm going to add a, or I'm going to subtract a negative standard deviation. So functionally, what ends up happening to get high levels of pain, I subtract a standard deviation. To get uh, low levels of pain, I add a standard deviation. And this doesn't make a lot of intuitive sense. It seems like if I want to recenter this to be uh, to be consistent with high pain, I should add a standard deviation or subtract a standard deviation to get low levels of pain. But if we think about this, this is my pain variable, right? My pain variable is centered at zero, right? And case number 23, case number 23 has a value of zero. Case number 23 has a value exactly at the mean, okay? But what I want to do, and I've got a standard deviation of 2.3, okay? What I want to do is I want to recenter this variable so that zero corresponds to high levels and low levels. So if I go through and I subtract a standard deviation, from all values in my center variable. I subtract a standard deviation from everybody, right? This case, right, that was at zero, if I subtract a standard deviation from everybody, right, this person is still at the mean, right? But John, where's my, where's the zero value relative to my person who has average levels of pain? Yeah, it's gonna be right here, is that person so if someone now is at zero, do they have high or do they have low levels of, of pain? They have high levels of pain, right? So by subtracting a standard deviation from everyone in the set, that person who was formerly at zero is now at negative, negative 2.3. My zero point now corresponds to a standard deviation above the mean, right? Same thing if I go through and I add a standard deviation to every value in the set. What that does is this person who was at the mean uh, uh, of two point, or uh, this who, person who was uh, at the mean is now case number 23 is now two, uh, at 2.3 because I added a standard deviation to everything. Now my zero point is below the mean. Zero corresponds to a value, a standard deviation below the mean, okay? And so what I do here is I'm going through and I say, I want to go through and evaluate my model at a standard deviation, uh, uh, with pain centered at a standard deviation above the mean and a standard deviation below the mean, right? Uh, pain centered at a standard deviation above the mean is going to correspond to people with high pain. Uh, a standard deviation below is going to correspond to low pain. And then what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to create two new interaction terms that correspond to conditional values of M at high and low levels of pain. Okay? So what this ends up doing, I end up creating a lot of extra variables in my model, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to create a new variable corresponding to high pain. I'm going to take everybody's center, then I'm going to take high pain and multiply it by my center PTSD variable. I'm going to take low pain, multiply it by center PTSD. And now I'm going to run two different regression models uh, where we've got uh, uh, looking at the relation of PTSD and my outcome at high levels of pain and low levels of pain. Okay. And so for my first model, and this is going to be looking at my conditional effect of pain at low, or PTSD at low levels of pain, I'm going to have my intercept, I'm going to have low pain, opiate use, PTSD, then I'm going to have opiate use times low pain and uh, low pain times PTSD. Um, so I did what I didn't put in here technically because I've got two interaction terms that have pain in them and this is the change that I made. Technically I should probably model that sort of create interaction. To any interaction term that has pain in it needs to be sort of adjusted to, to know that we're corresponding to low levels of pain. Okay. So this is going to give me my simple slopes uh, at low levels of pain. Uh, and what's going to happen here is within my, so this is my uh, simple slopes model for uh, the relation between PTSD and low levels of pain. This coefficient for PTSD in this model is going to tell me the conditional effect of PTSD on role functioning at low levels of pain. Because I've gone through in this model and estimated sort of every instance of pain in this model is consistent with my new variable that I've centered at low levels of pain. So then I'm going to create it, then I'm going to run another model, but this time I'm going to substitute in, instead of low pain, I'm going to substitute in my high pain variable, right? So now I've got a variable where uh, pain is centered to standard, uh, where zero point on my pain scale is a standard deviation above the mean, and so I've got my intercept, high pain, opiate use, PTSD, opiate use times high pain, and high pain times PTSD, right? So I've gone through and I've, I've, I've created these new interaction terms corresponding to my new variable where everything's centered at high levels of pain. And now this is going to be my conditional effect of PTSD at high levels of pain. So what we're doing with this is we're just shifting around the zero point on our, uh, on our pain scale, right? Because remember that uh, our regression models, any of our coefficients, are telling us, uh, are estimating the unique association of my predictor with my outcome with all other variables held constant and zero, right? And if I want to know, uh, if I want to estimate within the context of these multiplicative models what the relation of PTSD is with some outcome at some specific level of uh, uh, third variable, all I need to do is go through and recenter that uh, moderator so that the zero point corresponds to whatever value it is that I'm interested in looking at. Right? So here it's a standard deviation above and standard deviation below. I want to look at the relation between PTSD and, uh, and functioning at uh, high levels of pain, which is standard deviation above. Cool. Then I just go through and I reshunt my pain variables so zero corresponds to a standard deviation over the mean. And then go through and make sure all my interaction terms are, uh, that involve that term are sort of recalculated. I want to take a look at the relation with PTSD and outcome at uh, low levels of pain. Easy peasy. I just take my pain variable. Recenter that, re uh, center that so that zero ends up uh, corresponding to a standard deviation below the mean. Recalculate interaction terms and then take a look at uh, the association there. So this starts to become important. Um, when people talk about like, oh, this is kind of fun because it's kind of like a puzzle. It is, right? You're thinking about any time we're looking at an interaction uh, or in a, at a regression model, these coefficients correspond to the association of x and y when all of the variables have constant. So if I start playing around with what my zero term is, I can start moving things around. Okay? Now, if I just have an additive model without any interaction terms, Laura, does it matter where I center my other variables? No, it doesn't matter, right? If the relation of x with uh, my predictor with my outcome is going to be the same. It doesn't matter what those other variables, what level of the other variables are. But as soon as I have an interaction term, if I start centering and changing around what that zero term is, I start to see differences. It starts to change. Uh, the nature of the relation uh, of the association if these interaction terms are statistically significant. If they're not, if like this interaction term is literally zero, then 
pain has no impact on PTSD, and so I can sort of change it around to whatever it wants, right? Uh, but because our coefficients aren't always, aren't, are never exactly zero, uh, you almost always will see some change in uh, these effects with the model. People kind of following along and seeing kind of what we're doing with this. Okay, so let's jump in. Start out by centering our variables, right? Uh, so that our mean, uh, so the mean of all of our variables is going to be equal to, equal to zero. And then here we just took a look at our uh, uh, uncentered solution. Our uncentered solution is just our additive models, right? Um, do we see any difference across uh, our centered and our uncentered solutions? We think Kate. In our additive model, does the centered solution make a difference? So yeah, there's an, a difference in the unstandardized coefficient. Which unstandardized coefficient is different across my uh, uncentered, my centered solution? The what's that? When you once you center it, yeah. Your means change. All 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 of all of my bees. Just the constant. Just the constant, right? And can you tell me why the constant changes? What is my constant? What is what is what is the? How do I interpret the, the constant in my regression uh, equation? Okay, perfect. So in this model, we're looking at and this is just an additive model where we're looking at uh, the unique association of uh, PTSD, opioid use, and pain severity on functioning, right? In my uncentered model, uh, my constant uh, is associated with and my constant tells me. Uh, my expected uh, value of functioning when pain and PTSD for individuals who won't be using opiate use with no pain and no PTSD, right? What is the constant telling me in my centered solution? Right, right. And so in the centered solution, what does it mean when I'm holding PTSD and pain constant at zero? What is what is zero? What does zero mean in uh, for my centered variables? What does zero correspond to? The mean. The mean, right? And so, what does it mean? What does it mean when I'm saying that my constant is expected value uh, of my outcome when all of my vectors are held constant at zero? Okay. Anybody help me out? It's just when they're all held at their mean. When they're all held at their mean. Right? And so thinking about, and this is what I really want you to do, is think, think carefully about sort of what's going on. Not, not you, everybody. Not you, Nick, damn it. Um, so thinking carefully about this. So it makes some sense that our constant changes, right, if we're thinking about what our actual model is doing. This is saying, uh, this is the expected value for uh, role functioning for individuals who aren't using opiates, because opiate use is at zero, and for people with a PTSD or with a PTSD and a pain score of zero. Well, people aren't taking meds. They don't have any PTSD. They don't have any uh, pain. So I'd expect sort of their functioning to be fairly high, right? Uh, in this model, though, with our centered variables, right? We've centered a dichotomous variable. That's kind of weird because zero doesn't mean anything. We just talk about holding that constant or controlling for sort of that thing. So, but here, this is our expected value of our outcome uh, when for individuals at average levels of pain and average levels of PTSD controlling for medication use, right? And so if, just in terms of our continuous variables, if I have someone 
who's at average levels of pain in a help seeking sample and average levels of PTSD in a help seeking sample, those are people who are likely doing worse than people who have no pain, actually zero values of pain, zero values of PTSD. And so we see our functioning level, our, our expected value when all other variables are held constant at zero start to change, right? And so one, this starts to become important as you're working through these moderation models, thinking about always, always, always our regression models are telling us uh, uh, the relation or the expected value uh, uh, for this uh, predictor when everything else is held constant at zero. What you should be doing is think about what does that mean? Like literally write it out on a piece of paper, like what does it mean when these other values are held constant at zero? Here, it just means that there's literally the absence of pain or the absence of PTSD. Here, zero means average values, right? And so we can just start to play around with this to start to do different things, manipulate our regression models uh, and, and bend them to our will, right? So we talked about, uh, these are additive models, but with this, I can change, I can plug in whatever value of PTSD, pain, it doesn't change the association. The association is always the same, it's constant, right? Um, but if we start to uh, include our interaction terms, now we can start to look at moderation effects. Um, here, remember, so what we did is we have to go through, so we centered our variables, now we have to create our interaction terms, right? So here, uh, for my interaction of pain and PTSD, I'm just taking my centered pain, my centered PTSD, multiplying those together, now I have my interaction term. Here I'm taking my centered opiate use, and again, we'll talk about in this example, so one won't center opiate use, but for this portion, we're just saying holding it constant, right? So my centered opiate use, centered pain, now I've got an interaction of pain and opiate use here, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down and I'm going to run my regression. This is the outcome, I, uh, this is my output, this is my expected value uh, of functioning, when all other variables are held constant at zero. Uh, this is my, okay. And this starts to become important. Layla, do I have, do I have, do I have significant interaction effects? Um, between pain and PTSD. Pain and PTSD, and what about uh, opiate use and pain? Are close, close enough. Like I'm not going to call 051 and I'm not going to sort of scrap that. Right? We'll, for our purposes, we'll, we'll count this. And I would encourage you to do so if you're trying to publish this. I, if it, the reviewer gives you garbage, tell them to shut up. Um, okay. So if this is my model, right? So we are, Haley, can you tell me, give me an interpretation of this interaction effect? What is this interaction effect to tell me? Um. The effect of PTSD on role functioning is dependent on pain level. Beautiful. And what about this? The effect of is it pain on role functioning is dependent on opioid use. Exactly. This is a just a general interpretation of interaction, right? And we can even that layer on a third interaction, right? Or a third uh, layer two have a, a three-way interaction. If we had a three-way interaction of uh, opioid use, pain, and PTSD. I'm not scared of that, right? I just say that the interaction, the interactive effect of pain and PTSD is dependent on opioid use, right? That interaction looks different whether or not we're talking about people with, uh, who are using medications or those who aren't, right? We get that on a fourth way, but I don't know, sort of negative affect, right? So really, the three-way interaction of negative affect, pain and PTSD differs across people with, I mean, so it's just saying that sort of we've got something that's going through and changing sort of what this effect looks like, right? So. Evelyn, in the presence of these significant interaction effects, right? Tell me specifically what this effect of pain is is, uh, is getting at. So is it that as pain increases? Okay. So for for right for right now, let's let's not worry about sort of as one increases, one decreases. Uh, let's look one thing more general. What is what is the general interpretation of sort of this? It's, it's significant. It's significant, right? And so this is the unique effect of pain on role functioning when everything else is held constant. At okay, and so if or let's.
let's, and so let's let's actually take a look at PTSD because we conceptualize this as our as our uh, conditional effect, right? So, what is what is this uh, effect of PTSD telling us? Same type of thing. That um, the effect of PTSD on low functioning is significant when all other variables are held constant. Okay. And so if we're just, and mostly, so if we're interested in this interaction effect of pain and PTSD, what does this tell us about the relation between PTSD and our outcome? At what's, what's our third variable we're interested in this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, this is saying that the relation between PTSD and role functioning is statistically significant when pain is what? Health constant. Mm-hmm. At its mean, right? So at mean levels of pain, at average levels of pain, we see a statistically significant relation of PTSD and role functioning at average levels of pain. Now this interaction effect tells us if we start shifting around levels of pain, this coefficient is going to change, right? Because our significant interaction t- uh, tells us that by definition, uh, uh, pain level has a reliable impact on the association of P- uh, the unique effect of PTSD and, and functioning, right? But this model, and this starts to become important when we sort of get and there's some other effects. This model is telling me that at average levels of pain, at mean levels of pain, when pain is held constant at zero, which means the mean, we have a significant effect of PTSD, right? We could flip around and we could say at average levels of PTSD, pain has a significant association with neural functioning, right? Um, now, opioid use is a little bit sort of difficult because it's we sort of took the average, but we could say here uh, that uh, pain so we have a significant uh, interaction of opiate use and pain. We look at this and say, this is a conditional effect, right? These are all conditional effects. We would say that, uh, based on this model, we would say that uh, pain holds a, uh, a reliable association with functioning, uh, holding medication use constant. So, but this is our overall model. We can take coefficients from this. We can go through, write our equation. We can factor things out and we can get our simple slopes, right? And that's what we're doing here. We're just taking coefficients from this model, sort of like laying them out, restructuring our equation, and then we can go through and take a look at the, P, uh, the association of PTSD and role functioning at low levels of pain, substituting in standard deviation of, uh, below, and then high levels of pain, standard deviation above. And then we can go in, in Excel, and we can just take my simple slopes equation right here, and plug that into Excel and say equals blah, blah, and then just plug in high and low levels of pain. It'll give me uh, my, uh, um, it'll give me my plot up here, right? And so I'm happy with this. I can see what this uh, interaction of pain and PTSD looks like within the context of this model, right? And it suggests to me that I have a decent negative association between PTSD and functioning uh, at low levels of pain and probably very little association at high levels, right? But then what I want to do is I want to go through and I want to test this because this probably isn't going to be good enough for a paper. My reviewers are wanting to know, if I'm your reviewer, I want to know, is this association statistically reliable at low levels of pain and high levels of pain, okay? And I'll also probably want to ask you to give me effect sizes at low levels, high levels, things along those lines. And so what we can do is we can start changing uh, our um, regression model to go through and do this. So what I'm going to do is I've gone through and I've said, all right, give me the description, uh, just my descriptive statistics for my center pain, centered opioids, and center PTSD, right? So I get my descriptive statistics here, and then I say, okay, I need to, if uh, PTSD is my conditional effect, and pain is my moderator, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two new variables uh, to recenter uh, my moderator uh, so that zero is consistent with high and low levels of pain, okay? So I see that uh, for pain, my standard deviation is 1.342. But I ran it out longer, so just run it out longer in your syntax, just more precision here. Uh, but I'm gonna say compute low pain is my centered pain variable plus a standard deviation, right? This is intuitive, we think, oh, it's low levels, I should subtract a standard deviation. We're taking it and we're gonna go add a standard deviation to everybody. So now, people who were at the mean of zero, now have a mean of uh, 
or now have a, a value of 1.34187, and zero is hanging out here down below the key, right? Then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to compute a new variable called high pain. I'm going to take my standard center pain variable. I'm going to subtract a standard deviation. Now people who are at the mean of zero, after we subtract a value, uh, a standard deviation from everybody, this person who was uh, previous at the mean, and my zero point is now above the mean. Right? So I create my uh, new uh, variables, high and low uh, pain, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create new interaction terms. Just think about this as any, or any interaction term that had pain in it, we have to now restructure and create, uh, uh, and create a new interaction term that's consistent with low levels or high levels of pain. So we have low PTSD, uh, low pain and PTSD, high pain and PTSD, low pain and opiate use, high pain and opiate Okay. And this is the, the page that before I didn't, I didn't adjust my interaction terms for pain and opiate use because that's not the interaction term I'm looking at. Technically, it doesn't make an impact on your, on your simple slopes. But if you're going through and doing stuff, you should make sure that everything's correct. Okay. So what I've gone through it, I've uh, uh, created new variables corresponding to high, low and low, high and low levels of my moderator. And then I've gone through and I've recalculated my interaction terms uh, that uh, so that all my interaction terms that include this variable are adjusted for high and low levels. Okay. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the and I'm going to run a couple new regression models. I'm going to say I want to regress role functioning on because uh, I want to look at the simple slope of PTSD and functioning at low levels of pain. So my new model is going to contain low pain, centered opiate use, centered PTSD, low pain times PTSD, and low pain times opiate use. I go through and I take a look uh, here, uh, and this is uh, coefficients for my model. What, John, what coefficient in this model am I, am I, is my primary, is of primary interest? Okay, no, not the constant. Why, why, did, why did I run this model? What am I interested in? Okay, so I didn't have low versus high PTSD in this model, right? I had high and low levels of my moderator, right? Or high and low levels of my moderator. So this is my low pain uh, model. So what am I interested in based on my interaction? Okay. What's my conditional effect for this? What's my conditional effect of interest? So I'm looking at the interaction of, of pain and PTSD. PTSD, right? If I go through, so this is my model. It's got low pain, OB use PTSD, low OB use PTSD, low OB use, uh, or low pain and OB use. Low pain and OB use is just sort of to make sure everything's consistent, that everything's squared with the world, right? Uh, but what I'm really interested in here is my conditional effect of PTSD. If I take a look, my conditional effect of PTSD at low levels of pain, I have an unstandardized coefficient of 4.13. This is statistically significant, and here are my partial correlation uh, and my semi-partial correlation for my conditional effect of PTSD at low levels of pain. And then if I go back through and I say, okay, now I want to look at the conditional effect of PTSD at high levels of pain. So I go through and I run a second model. But instead of low PTSD or low pain, I just substitute my variable for high pain. So I have high pain, opiate use, PTSD, high PTSD, or high pain and PTSD, high pain and opiate use. Okay. I run that model. Here's my uh, simple slopes model. Uh, looking at the conditional effect of PTSD at high levels of pain. And Nick, what's the coefficient I'm interested in looking at here? What's that? Uh, so here's my conditional, my simple slopes model uh, at high levels of pain. What's the coefficient I'm wanting to, I'm, uh, I'm interested in, in this model? Still the PTSD. Still the PTSD. And what's going on in PTSD in this, mo in this uh, model relative to the other model? Uh, this one's not significant. It's not statistically significant. It's, it's positive, it's 0.03, right? Uh, but we see that it's very clearly not statistically reliable. Here's my partial coefficient and my semi-partial coefficient right here, right? So what I've done across these models is I've just gone through, so I have a significant interaction of pain and PTSD, right? I 
so I know that uh, the association of PTSD with my outcome changes depending on sort of the value of, of my pain score. And so what I've decided to do is look at the associated, the unique effect of PTSD and neural functioning at high and low levels of pain. Now the value I actually choose is kind of arbitrary. Convention says a standard deviation above the floor. I can choose a standard deviation and a half, I can choose seven standard deviations. The problem is, is like no one's hanging out at seven standard. It, my model will estimate something, but it's not actually a value that maps on to anything, right? And as I start to increase uh, the value of my moderator, my slopes start to get increasingly different, right? Um, but uh, general convention is looking at a standard deviation above, standard, de standard deviation below. I see here uh, at low levels of PTSD, I have a, a clear uh, association, a negative association between uh, PTSD and role functioning. But at high levels of pain, I get uh, uh, no uh, basically a zero effect uh, at high levels of pain. This is the other, now I can't impress, this is gonna be a nightmare. First time you're trying to run moderation analyses, it's always a nightmare. There's a lot of moving parts. You're gonna screw something up. And this is why it's important to always, always have uh, double checks. If things have gone right, everything should square up. Uh, Haley, uh, pull up your sort of the previous page Tell me what, based on sort of our hand calculations, what do we calculate the, uh, the simple slope for PTSD at low levels of pain would be based on our on the page with our sort of graph and our sort of factoring? Negative 0.413. Negative 0.413. What was my value based on my factoring that I had my simple slope for PTSD at high levels of pain? 0 0.043. 0.043, right? It, on account of math, everything turns out, should turn out to be everything should square up. Now this is where you want to be careful. Grounding stuff can start to mess with things. But this is a good way to go through and check to make sure. Hand factoring this is sort of one, just a nice didactic exercise, but it's also a nice uh, double check to make sure that you've gotten your simple slopes correctly and everything squares up, right? Um, uh, so everything should come together here, okay? Now if I were to uh, Kate, let's say I go through and I recenter my pain variables to be two standard deviations above and below the mean. Would I get the same simple slopes here? Uh, yeah. All right. So if I say that the associated, uh, the unique effect of PTSD and role functioning changes depending on the level uh, of my moderator. Here, uh, center my moderator, so high and low values are standard deviation above and below. If I were to change that and make that two standard deviations above and below, would I have the same simple slopes? Oh, yeah. What's that? I, I don't know what they can Okay, so, so again, the idea is that mm, the association of PTSD and my outcome depends on the value of my, of my moderator, in this case, pain. In this example, We've gone through and we've calculated, we've recentered my pain variables so that high and low levels are a standard deviation above and standard deviation below. But if I were to do this again and uh, say my recenter my uh, moderator so a standard or the high levels are two standard deviations above and low levels are two standard deviations below, would my simple slopes be the same? If I put in different values of pain, no, they're not going to be right. And so if this is, um, this is PTSD, or is, let's say this is not, but it'd be easier to look at it this way. Let's say that this is levels at average levels of my moderator, right? And this is standard deviation above and standard deviation below, right? If I go through and I say two standard deviations above and two standard deviations below, right? What do I look like? It's like that. Okay. So sort of the slope of these lines is dependent on, so this is I mean, this is negative one standard deviation, one standard deviation, this is plus two standard deviations. This is negative two standard deviations, right? Um, 
one of the things that remember with these simple slopes and with these interaction effects, the ways that we've modeled them here, is my slope is a linear function of my of my moderator. As my moderator goes down and up, this changes around, right? So depending on what values I'm calling high and low values, that's going to change the coefficient for my simple slopes, right? So the, the point that we choose is really kind of arbitrary. Standard deviation is just kind of nice because it's something that is conventional. We can all just kind of agree that, yeah, standard deviation above and below is meaningful, right? But if I were to go through and start increasing, making my high and low values more of an extreme, it's just going to increase the separation of those, of, of those, of my simple slope lines, okay? And so this is the thing. Sometimes, and this is just a general preference, uh, but sometimes you'll see when people uh, model these out, Right? And I've had this happen. People saw us say, here's high levels and here's low levels. And people say, oh, well, you need to, you should also include mean values as well. All right, fine. I, I don't have to run the model. I just get a protractor and bisect those two lines, and that's, that's what it's going to be, right? If I want to do a half standard deviation, it's just going to be there and it's right there, right? Uh, so, but again, the thing I want you to sort of kind of impress is that uh, the values that we set our moderator at, standard deviation below and standard deviation above is just convention, right? Uh, but if we start to increase sort of the what constitutes my uh, high levels and low levels, it's it's just going to it's just a linear function, right? We just take this and sort of bring it up and down, it's not going to do different stuff in here, right? But, so standard deviation above and below is convention, um, but uh, if we're working with something where there's a high level or a low level, that, of, or there's a, a value from my moderator that starts to make sense or is conceptually meaningful, use that, right? So this is standard deviation above and below, or at this point is the time when sort of my, I get cut off from something, or at this point is when something starts to become unstable, right? You can go through and play around with this, but in general, you generally see it standard deviation above, standard deviation below. Questions on this? So for my simple slopes, only thing we've got out of this whole situation is just this test statistic for PTSD at low levels of pain, PTSD at high levels of pain, uh, and then calculating my part and partial correlations as well. Right? Everything else we can just get from our base model and factor it out, get those values, uh, but this is the only thing that's changing. Also note uh, that my interaction terms are staying consistent. Right. Uh, what I do with my lower order terms should make no difference. If you've done this correctly, your highest order interaction should be identical across your models. Okay? Now, if I had a three-way interaction, then my three-way interaction would be the same. My two ways would change around, right? In this case, these two-way interactions are my highest order interactions. You'll see that these are identical in both of these models, and the other coefficients change because everything else in the model is a conditional effect. Questions on this? Okay, so let's go down and uh, take a look at because I've got another uh, significant interaction here uh, for opiate use. Right, I've got an interaction of opiate use and pain. This is so I include. I like this example because it's got a couple different things, and so the way we're approaching this is going to be a little bit different. Um, but in terms of getting generating my simple slopes, going to do it the same way as we did before. I can take my uh, base model. And I can go through and factor this out uh, to get the simple slopes for uh, the simple slopes for pain uh, uh, and roll functioning for people who aren't using opiates and for people who are using opiates. Right? Just factoring this equation just as we did before. Again, starting with the, the full thing, sort of factoring it down, went through this example getting high and low, or uh, the conditional uh, effect of pain on role functioning for people who aren't using opiates, negative 0.5 in our set, and 0.5 uh, for people who are. Okay. Now both of these, if I'm looking at this, 
both of these look like they're negative and probably statistically significant, but still might want to go through and calculate an effect size and uh, a test statistic for both of these. Okay? So what I'm going to do now, and this is going to be a little bit different, what I'm going to do in SPSS, right? So I've got my original opiate use variable, or my original uh, variable for opiate use, my dichotomous variable, right? That's zero, no, uh, one, yes. Okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new variable, right? Right alongside my other variable, I'm going to call it here opiate R, that's going to flip it around. Now zero is my reference group. This is constitutes people who are using opiates, one being those who aren't using so this is a fairly easy thing to do in SPSS. You just go through and sort by opiate use, and then next to it, you just put in people who have no opiate use, so the ones or zeros in, the, in uh, my original variable. Just plug in ones. We will have ones, plug in zeros. And now I've just got the reverse, right? So in my first one, zero, in my first of my original variable, zero indicates no opiate use. In my uh, new variable, zero indicates opiate use, right? So we're just switching these around. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through and I'm going to create uh, inter two new interaction terms here, right? One that's going to be no opiate use by pain, because remember I only have one interaction term that has opiate use, and it's just the interaction of opiate use and pain, right? So I'm going to create a new interaction term, uh, uh, label it no opiate by pain, and this is just going to be my original dummy code, my original opiate uh, variable, where zero is no use, one is use, multiply that by center of pain. And then here, I'm gonna say my interaction for yes opiate use and uh, pain. And this is just gonna be my reverse coded opiate use variable times center of pain. Laura, can you tell me what, what am I doing with this? What, what am I, why, why did I reverse code that opiate use and, and why am I using my dummy codes instead of my it's in my centered opiate use variable to look at the uh, simple slopes here. Because you think it's something to do with that zero is like a meaningful thing, and it's a constant, and that's why each of the groups is not to be one zero. They're both one. Right on. Okay. What I'm going to do, my first, uh, uh, so I've gone through, created my new interaction terms here, right? And so what I'm going to do is my first, uh, for my first simple slopes model, I'm going to regress roll functioning on a centered pane, and then my just my dummy code opiate use, my original opiate uh, opiate uh, use variable that's zero, no, one, yes, times centered uh, and then centered PTSD, pain times PTSD. That's not a part of this, so that we don't need to screw around with anything there. And then my interaction of no opiate use and pain. My interaction of no opiate use and pain is my original dummy code multiplied by centered pain. Uh, and if I do that, this is my model. So my predictors are centered pain, opiate use, zero, one, centered PTSD, pain times PTSD interaction, and my no opiate use but times pain interaction. Okay. And Emilio, what are, what's, what's, the, what's the coefficient that I'm interested in here? Uh, centered pain value. So. Centered pain value, yeah. And so what is, the, what is, this, what is this coefficient telling me? Technically, because we've got a lot of sort of interaction terms, I would say uh, for uh, sort of uh, this is going to be uh, my uh, unique effect of pain severity on roll functioning for people who aren't using opiates holding PTSD constant at the mean, right? So again, wanting to think about sort of what's going on here with this, right? So again, in this model. I've replaced my centered opiate use variable when I've got, or when I've, when I've got centered opiate use. It just kind of means controlling for opiate use because zero isn't actually a value. It's just kind of taking the average across people who do or who are and aren't using opiate use. But here, opiate use is a dichotomous variable. It's zero and it's one. If I'm holding opiate use constant at zero, who am I talking about, Layla? If, it, if, I, if I'm holding it constant at zero in my original dummy code. People who aren't using opiates, right? So again, what I've done in this model is I'm looking at uh, the 
unique effect of pain severity on role functioning for people who aren't using opiates, because opiate use is set equal to pain, and then I've adjusted this interaction. Okay, and then in my other, uh, my next model, I go through, and this time we'll run the same model, except this time I go through. I have centered pain, my reverse coded opiate use, right? And Evelyn, what's what's going on? My uh, reverse coded opiate use. How's that? Perfect. So we've got my reverse coded opiate use, center PTSD, pain types PTSD, and then sort of my interaction term that has my reverse coded item in there, right? And Haley, what's uh, what am I looking at it in my uh, simple slopes effect here? Um, your centered pain value again. Centered pain value, yeah. right? And what is this telling me? For opioid users, there's a significant effect of pain on well functioning. Holding PTSD constant. Yeah. Right. Uh, so what we've done is we've just changed around. Again, all of this comes down to who do I want to look at, and then that's the people I don't need to make uh, the values consistent for zeroing. Uh, here, I can just go through and I plug in my original dummy code, uh, change my interaction term, because before the interaction term was we were using that centered opiate use, uh, centered opiate uh, uh, variable. But now I'm just going to go through, I'm going to take my original dummy code, multiply it by centered pain, and now my model is giving me uh, the unique effect of pain on role functioning for uh, when everything else is held constant at zero. Well, that means when opiate use is zero, it just means people who aren't using opiates, right? And if I want to look at people who are using opiates, then I just reverse code that, right? Now zero means people who correspond to people who are using opiate medications, and then I just rerun my model, and now I get my uh, simple slopes for individuals who are using uh, medications. So again, uh, Kate, can you flip back to uh, the page that has our, where we hand factored everything out? What was my simple slope for uh, pain for people who aren't using opiates? Um, 12 point, three, 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 three. Okay. Well, I'm off to a 10 thousandths point, but I will call that around here. What about uh, the simple slopes calculated for people who are using pain? or who aren't uh, using, uh, or who are using opiates? Uh, 7.745. Yeah, okay. So again, this is imperative to go back to, always want to check to make sure that your factoring is correct, that everything is summing up to zero. This is going to give you confidence that the, the simple slopes and the effects that you're reporting are consistent with stuff. So, and then visually look at your graphs, right? Make sure that the simple slopes that you've calculated are consistent with what you've mapped out on, on your graph. This is just this is just one of these one of these analyses that there's just a lot. It starts to get it gets easier once you've done several of them and you start to understand like oh these are the things I need to go through. But it's 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 frustrating in the beginning because there's just a lot of different things and if you sort of switch a sign or something goes wrong, it's going to throw everything off. So it's always important to have these fail checks or these fail saves. In here. Okay. Questions on this? People kind of see the procedure and, and why this is working the way it is. Any questions at all? Okay. Um, so if I go through one to just uh, touch on um, again, taking a look at the effects and the impacts of centering on uh, our regression uh, models. Again, if I'm looking at just my uh, additive regression model, comparing my centered, my uncentered solution, with my additive uh, models, everything is going to be this uh, in terms of my model summary, right? So my model, this is just uh, testing my R squared value, right? Is my R squared significant? Uh, R squared is the same, identical. Coefficients are identical except for, uh, which one, Nick? The constant. The constant. My constant will be different. Again, thinking about this, and this makes some sense in terms of what's my expected value of my outcome when all, when all the rest of my predictors are out constant at zero. It's the question of, does that mean like actual zero values, or does it mean sort of the mean and my centered value, right? 
buried in my center solution. So that's all the same. Uh, in my multiplicative models, again, my model summary, my overall model is, is the same. The, my model itself doesn't care where the center value, where zero value is in terms of my overall R squared. But I will see differences in terms of my uh, coefficients, right? Uh, here, this is a different, or, so here we're going through, take a look, we're seeing uh, my constants is different, uh, and I'm seeing my first order effects are different, but my interaction terms aren't, okay? Remember that our interaction, your interaction terms, your highest order, your highest order terms in these regression models are going to remain consistent no matter where you're centering anything, okay? So if I'm looking at my uh, interactions, it does not matter whether or not I'm looking at my centered solution or my uncentered solution. My coefficients are identical here, right? But I see my first order effects start to change around. And again, this starts to make some sense. In the presence of a significant interaction, it's saying that the unique effect of each one of my predictors changes depending on the value of the other predictors. Well, I've changed what the zero value means for my other predictors, and so I'm seeing changes across uh, my first order effects. Okay, so basically, this is looking at uh, here, this is the unique effect of pain with role functioning, with PTSD uh, holding uh, uh, opiate use constant with PTSD held constant at the mean. Right? And this is my unique effect of PTSD with role functioning, uh, holding pain constant at the mean, controlling for opiate use. Right? That's a different model than what's being estimated over here. This is my unique effect of pain uh, with role functioning for people with, who aren't using opiates with no PTSD. Right? And this is uh, my uh, a unique effect of PTSD on role functioning uh, for individuals who aren't using opiates who have no pain values, right? And so these significant, if these interaction terms are statistically significant, we would expect these values to jump around quite a bit because holding everything else constant at zero means something very different here than it does here. So we see differences, uh, our higher order effects are the same across my centered and my uncentered solutions. Uh, my first order effects jump around, those are different because they're talking about different things, right? Um, I also do see differences in my collinearity uh, uh, statistics. Um, if I'm looking at my VAF, VIFs, um, my variance inflation factors uh, in my uh, centered solution, I don't have any obvious concerns with collinearity. Uh, in my uncentered solution, yikes, those are massive, massive, this, this, this suggests massive issues with um, uh, collinearity, okay? Now what ends up happening is, so my covariance, which associated is, is related, is, this is how we get my correlations, uh, this is based in, uh, at least in part, on the means of my individual predictors, if I start to change my means around, it changes my covariance. And so basically, historically, this is one of the things that people have talked about, benefits of centering, is it reduces collinearity in your model, okay? Now, the practical impact on your outcome is nothing, okay? It doesn't change anything that you see in here, right? So in OLS regression models, the collinearity we see here doesn't actually it has, it has no practical impact on anything, okay? And so you start to see in uh, some like Andrew Hayes' stuff, uh, people will start saying like, oh, you don't need to center, you don't need to center because it doesn't make a difference, which is, is fair. Um, but one, centering does help with interpretation, right? Because it puts zero at reasonable values, whereas oftentimes zero isn't at a reasonable, reasonable value. Um, uh, Two, it makes, uh, centering makes uh, factoring out these multiplicative models easier, right? Uh, because I just add a standard deviation, subtract a standard deviation, it's the same value, it's just plus or minus, makes those calculations easier. I mean, you can do it, but then you just have to take whatever the mean is and then add a standard deviation, subtract a standard deviation, and it ends up being kind of a pain. Uh, and then three, if you start working in uh, like SEM types of frameworks, 
if you're working with maximum likelihood estimation, things along those lines, and you start having something this high level, it'll start to crash your model. You're getting on positive, uh, definite matrix errors and things along these lines. And so, um, and I'm just saying this because you may see people like, oh, centering stupid, you don't need to center. Well, it kind of depends on what we're talking about, right? Centering doesn't hurt anything. And, and so we'll see our uh, variance inflation factor, uh, our VIF, our collinearity go down. Um, that actually doesn't mean anything within the context of our OLS regression, but it does with, do with different types of things, right? And just at the end of the day, interpretability is better. There's advantages there. So would encourage you to continue to center your model because of that. Yeah. All right, uh, correlations. Um, our centering depends, depends on what correlations I'm talking about, right? For my sort of first order effects, centering has no impact on my uh, on my first order effects. Uh, but again, we can see as we saw with the uh, variance inflation factors, it impacts the correlations of our uh, of our multiplicative models here in the uncentered solution. You can see really, really high correlations between some of our uh, interactive effects and our first order effects, those go away in the centered solution. And that's just a matter of the calculation. It's not a good indicator of sort of strength of association and stuff here, but you'll see uh, stuff there. Um, and then in terms of our simple slopes, um, this isn't a centering issue. I need to change that. This is just uh, for you in terms of a double check. When you've gone through and you've run your main, your overall model, right, with your interaction terms, and then you run your simple slopes, if you've done it correctly, what should you see in terms of similarities and differences, right? Uh, uh, in this case, right, uh, you should see that your interaction terms should be identical in your simple slopes models and your overall model. Your highest order interaction terms should not change. If they're changing, if they're not the same, then you've done something incorrect. Okay. Um, you'll also see that your moderator, coefficient for your moderator, coefficient for your moderator also doesn't change. Here we've got low pain, high pain, doesn't matter. That still, that coefficient is the same. But in this case, where we have uh, opioid use and PTSD are both conditional effects, we're going to see that these values are going to change relative to the values uh, in each one of the models, and obviously my constant is gonna change around, okay? So again, as you run these models, always, always, always a good idea to go through and take a look at your coefficients, compare those against your baseline model, and say, are the things that are changing things that should be changing based on sort of the model that I've run? Questions on this? All right, one last thing and then we'll take a break. Okay, um, issue that goes on um, when SPSS, so you'll notice throughout each one of these, my, I've got sort of this barred box down to all your standardized coefficients on, uh, for your multiplicative effects, right? That's because if you run these moderation analyses, the standardized coefficients that you get from SPSS are not correct. The way state SPSS creates your standardized solution, and you can, and I would encourage you to just play around with this, just try this out. Uh, in that beta category where you see your standardized coefficients, the way SPSS derives those is SPSS just sort of not on your data sheet, but sort of in, it, in sort of the brain and guts. All SPSS is doing is it's taking all of your predictors and all of and your outcome, and it's creating Z scores for all the variables in your model. And then it's just regressing the z-scores of your outcome onto the z-scores of your predictors. And then whatever the co unstandardized coefficients are for that for regression model, those are just reported as your standardized coefficients. Right? And this makes some sense, right? Uh, Haley, what is, how do we interpret our standardized, what is our, what is our standard, what do we, how do we interpret our standardized coefficient? What is it, like a literal interpretation, what does that mean? Oh, for, uh Every one unit increase in our DD, we um, oh, 
oh, for every one unit increase or standard deviation increase in our predictor or IV, mm -hmm. we would expect the standardized amount DV increase. Yeah. So you got it, right? Okay. Basically, for uh, given a standard deviation unit increase in X, we expect a corresponding standard deviation uh, change in Y, right? Um, and so if my regression model is Y equals X1 plus and we, Y equals beta 0 plus B1, X1, plus B2, X2, right? All SPSS does is just takes my X1 and X2 and my Y and just creates Z-scores for Y and Z-scores for X1 and Z-scores for X2 and then just regresses Z of Y onto beta 1, Z, X1, plus beta 2, Z, X2. And this expected value of my outcome when uh, X1 and X2 are equal to zero, which if it's a Z-score, that just means the mean is gonna run it through the mean of Y, right? This is just gonna be zero, that way you don't, that's why you don't get a standardized coefficient for that, right? Um, so all SPSS is doing, and you can do this too, like for in sort of one of the examples that we've done, just go through and take uh, uh, Z-scores for your outcome and Z-scores for both of your predictors, and then regress the Z-scores of Y onto the Z-scores of your predictors, and then just look at the coefficients that you get in that regression model. They'll be the same as your standardized coefficients in your unstandardized regression model. That's all, that's all SPSS is doing. So, uh, all SPSS is doing here is it's taking, standardizing all of your uh, variables so to have a mean of one, a mean of zero, standard deviation of one, and then taking the z-scores of my outcome, and then just regressing them onto my stuff here, okay? Now the problem is, is that when SPSS does this, I can't go through and factor out my, uh, I can't factor that uh, standardized model out the same way I can standardize uh, or factor out a um, my unstandardized uh, model because what's happening is what I need in sort of my uh, in my uh, unstandardized model right I'm I'm saying that the interaction of sort of opiate use and pain and opiate use and PTSD I'm kind of pulling those components out right uh, but what SPSS is doing is SPSS instead of taking uh, and remember, so when we're calculating our interaction effects, right, we're taking opiate use times pain. We're taking PTSD times pain, right? So we're actually calculating a product there, right? What SPSS is doing is, is when we go through and we have our interaction terms, SPSS is just taking the z-score of my interaction term and the z-score of this interaction term. Well, that's just taking sort of the mean of my interaction term and then subtracting it, subtracting each value from mean and then dividing by standard deviation, I can't, the, the z-score for my opiate use by pain interaction is not the same thing as the z-score of my pain scores and the z-score of my opiate, uh, or my opiate use scores multiplied, right? And for PTSD and pain, the z-score for pain and the z-score for PTSD is not the same as the z-score for that product term that I got before. So what ends up happening is my standardized coefficients aren't valid. The standardized coefficients the P that uh, SPSS is giving me in these multiplicative models aren't correct. Okay. But luckily what we can do is knowing sort of what's going on and how we go through and do this, we can go through and calculate proper uh, standardized coefficients for these models. And this is important too, right, because if we're reporting our uh, regression uh, table, we often want to have standardized coefficients reported in there. But what we can't do is we can't just pull these off of SPSS because SPSS is not giving the right stuff. Uh, so what we would then do, if I'm working on, say, this model, and I want to have standard, uh, appropriate standardized coefficients for my interaction terms, what I need to do is I need to go through and take my, 
outcome, in this case role functioning, pain, opiate use, and PTSD, calculate Z scores for all of for my outcome and my predictor. And then once I have the Z scores, then I need to create proper interaction terms for that standardized solution. So I take here Z score for, for opiate Z pain interaction term. Same thing here, Z pain and Z PTSD. Basically doing the same, creating interaction terms as we had before, right? And then what I can do is then I, this I can factor out, right? So again, I go through and I have Z roll, Z pain, Z PTSD, and Z opiate use, right? And my SPSS is one, two, three, blah, blah, blah. Okay, these are my variables. So I've just created my Z scores, right? We create these Z scores all the time. Then what I need to do in my syntax, I need to go compute uh, Z pain by PTSD is equal to right. I need to just create an interaction term just like I did before. Do the same thing for OB use, right? Because what I can do then is then uh, if this is my this is my model, I can now take these and I can start factoring these out like I had before. Because otherwise what I've done is you've gone through and if you have, so let's say I've got I got pain times PTSD. Like this is the interaction term that I created for my base model, right? If I uh, if I just run my if I'm looking at my standardized coefficients in my regression model, it's just SPSS is just taking the z-score of those values. I can't break those apart. That's just a standardized score of those. I can't mathematically factor those out. So what I need to do if I want to create if I want to get my uh, standardized coefficients, I would really have to take the z-scores of all my predictors and my outcome, and I just need to multiply the z-scores to get my interaction terms, and then include those as my as my uh, predictors and my interactions there. Okay. Kind of seeing what's going on here. Yes. What's that? I haven't figured that out yet, um, but I think so. Yes. But there's some other things we can talk about that. But yeah, I think it's the same issue as in same issue as in said I haven't quite sort of worked through that. People see what the issue is, how we go through and, and, and address it. Uh, basically, it's just running the same model as before. You just need to go through and create standardized interactions that are uh, a product of your two z scores for your relevant uh, predictors. Okay, and so with this standardized, this is the only time you would standardize your outcome variable for, for your standardized uh, for, uh, effects here. Questions? All right. Um, let's go through, take a break, uh, and come back. Yeah, come back. In. How, how are people feeling about moderation? Thank you. Being honest, <laughs> like, I don't know what the hell's going on. Um, it's all right. Uh, it, it helps to go through, and we didn't have time. I'll go through and post those, those tutorials. I mean, it'll be the same thing as we walk through here, but sometimes it's just nice to see sort of how it's, it's playing out and uh, on stuff. We can all go through and, and uh, work on that there. Okay. So, last thing we want to talk about in terms of. Uh, these regression models is how we start running a regression analysis with uh, categorical variables. Okay, this can start to become an important thing if we're working with wanting to run um, like ANOVA and group-based analyses within the context of a regression environment. It's no different than what you would do in an ANOVA model, but if we start 
one look at the direct interactive effects of combinations of categorical and continuous variables. You can't do that in an analog model. We have to be working with this uh, uh, within a, a regression format. So I wanted to go through here. Um, a lot of different ways to go about this, and there's a lot of different strategies. Aiken and West goes work through a number of different strategies for coding categorical variables. Um, but one of the uh, most common and sort of more straightforward ways to go about this uh, is if I have a, let's say, a predictor that has three or more levels. If I've just got two levels, then that's fine. That's just a dummy variable. That's that's okay, right? A, a dichotomous indicators can go in my regression model. Uh, but if I have a, uh, a nominal variable with three or more categories, I have to do something with that. I can't just drop that into my regression equation. And one of the things we can do is we can start creating dummy variables, okay? Dummy variable is gonna have G minus one binary codes for some specified, uh, for different categories, groups, and one of these is gonna be a uh, the reference category. So if I've got uh, a variable with three different levels, I mean, how many dummy codes do I need to account for that within the context of a model? One being the reference. Yeah. So how many how many dummy codes? If it's G one G minus one codes, if I've got three levels, how many do I need? Two, right? Uh, because what I'm going to do is one of those vari one of those uh, categories is going to be my reference, and then I'm going to have two different dummy codes. Okay. So let's say that I have some data. Uh, and I'm interested in the association of degree and GPA with starting salary, okay? And so my question is, what's the unique association of degree and GPA with starting salary? And then I wanna go through and say, does degree moderate the association of GPA and starting salary, right? So I've got a question about direct effects, and then I have a, a direction about a moderation effect, right? I have an interaction that I'm wanting to take care of. Uh, and so the degrees that I have, I've got a liberal arts degree, an engineering degree, and a business degree. Okay, but this is a nominal variable. I can't just drop this into SPSS. SPSS, I mean, an SPSS will give me something. It just won't make any sense, right? Um, so what I can do is I can take my degree variable and I can dummy code this, okay? Uh, and so what, I, what you need to do in terms of your dummy code is you need to uh, make a determination, who do I want to be my reference group? Your reference group should make some theoretical sense. Like who's who's my sort of my baseline sort of comparison group in this case. And so uh, here in this example, what I've decided is that liberal arts is my reference group. They're my zero point. They're sort of the, my just general comparison group. And so what I do is I've got uh, my degree uh, variable has three levels. What I do is I create two dummy codes. I get a, I have a dummy code for engineering and I have a dummy code for business. My dummy code for engineering, anybody who's an engineer gets a one value, everybody else gets a zero. For my business, everybody who has a business degree gets a one, everybody else gets a zero, okay? Um, and so I can go through and dummy code this. So here you can see what SPSS might look like. We've got our participant number, our degree, right? This is our categorical variable. We've got our GPA, continuous, starting salary, continuous. Then I've got my dummy for engineering, my dummy for business. Um, and so we can see if we've got three is a business degree, this person has a one for this, zero for that. Uh, here's an engineer, has a one in my dummy for engineering, zero for business. Uh, what's going on for my uh, person with liberal arts? Laura, what do they have for dummies on, uh, uh, what's their value for engineering business? Zeros. Both zeros, right. And so what ends up happening is with this dummy code, I can now go through and uh, run a regression model where I'm looking at comparing starting salaries across different degree programs. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna regress my starting salary onto, onto my dummy for engineering and onto my dummy for business, okay? And if I run this out, this is, let's say, the, the coefficients I get. I get uh, uh, intercept is 21,000, uh, my coefficient for engineering is 6,999. Uh, my coefficient for my business dummy is 3,000, okay? So, uh, with my coefficients, uh, I've got my, my intercept is my mean salary for liberal arts. 
David, why is this my, why does this represent my mean starting salary for individuals in a liberal arts degree? Because you coded liberal arts at zero. Okay. Well, I didn't code liberal arts at zero, but what did I do with my two dummies? Uh, I mean, you made it so that zero is equivalent to liberal arts. Right, but in my dummies, so for my business dummy, zero could be anybody, this is just engine, people who are engineers or not, right? So this, uh, my engineering dummy, anybody who's a business degree or a liberal arts is gonna be zero. Business, anybody who's an engineer or a liberal arts is gonna be zero. What's, what's my technical interpretation of my intercept? When everything else is held When everything else is zero, right? But, if my dummy for engineering is zero, and my dummy for business is zero, who am I talking about? Liberal arts. My liberal arts folks, right? And so this is important when we're thinking about uh, categorical variables, again, thinking about how my reference uh, group starts to come in. And so this is why uh, Emilio had, had, a, had a slip to say, oh, I'm gonna cre create three uh, dummies for uh, my degree, right? I'm gonna have a dummy for business, a dummy for engineering, and a dummy for uh, uh, liberal arts. If I tried to regress salary onto all three of those dummies, I'd get an error message, right? Uh, because what I have is a singularity within there because if I know what my value for engineering dummy is and I know what my uh, business dummy is, that determines my other one and it, it's, it's gonna fall apart, right? You'll do this too. You, I still did it, did it what, a couple weeks ago. I went through the great dummies and then regressed a bunch of stuff and everything turned out it would be sort of gave me a sort of terrible error, right? What it is is just you work code in here, like so you sort of screwed things up, right? So with your dummies, you're always gonna have one less category than the number of levels here. So uh, yes, uh, so my intercept, this is gonna be my mean salary for my liberal arts group uh, because this is the expected value of, uh, of salary when both of these are held constant at zero, okay? So this in this model, this is my uh, expected value for liberal arts. Uh, my coefficient here uh, for B1, this is the difference in mean salary for engineering versus liberal arts, right? If I take uh, uh, my intercept plus this coefficient here, this is my mean salary for engineers. John, can you tell me why? Got your regression equation and, and sort of looking at this, right? You're absolutely right. Because if I'm talking about engineers, right, then I've got a one here. And if I'm an engineer, I'm not a business major. So that's zero, that goes away, right? And again, remember the thing, remember that we're talking, we're working with, with these uh, regression equations as an additive model. This is my baseline. This is where I start. So this is where my uh, liberal arts folks are. And then this is my adjustment for engineering up or down. Right? So what I've done is I've taken sort of this value, and then if engineering is a one, then we've got this business. If this is one, that can't be one, so that's gone, right? And so what I end up with is uh, my coefficient for engineering is just the difference between my engineers and my base category. So we get a, a raise of about $7,000 if I'm an engineer versus a liberal arts uh, major, and if I just add these two, that's just telling me what my average salary is for engineers, okay? Here we go. And then the same thing, uh, uh, my coefficient for business, this is the difference in mean salary for business versus liberal arts. Again, if I add my intercept and my coefficient for business, this is just giving me the mean salary for business majors because all I'm doing is I'm taking, here's my base, and then here's my adjustment for business up or down, right? Uh, and it looks like that's a $3,000 bump. And then we've got our business degree right there, right? Uh, and so this regression model, where I've regressed my indicator, or when I've regressed salary onto my indicators, this is just telling me uh, 
the difference in expected salary for each one of these groups. What did I what did I just run here? An ANOVA? I just ran an ANOVA. I just ran an ANOVA within the context of a regression model, right? I just dummy these up and this is just this is just my omnibus effect, my R squared or my, my regression model here is just telling me whether or not I have differences in average values across each one of these uh, across each one of the each one of these degree programs. Okay. So again, remember that ANO is just a special case of regression. This is how I could go through and do this. So if I have a significant model, it just tells me that yep, there are differences in uh, in starting salary across these degrees. And if I want to know sort of what those differences are. I just say this is uh, liberal arts, this and this is engineering, this and that's uh, business. This is just the difference between my base and my engineering. This is the difference between my base and my business. So it gives us all this information that we would need to know. Okay. Do I even need to run specific effects in this? If my coefficient for, if my effect for my engineering dummy is statistically significant, what does this tell me? And so this regression model actually does sort of a lot of nice stuff, sort of the same thing that our, our, our ANOVA model would, uh, would do anyway. Okay. So we will see kind of how we've gone through, coded this, and, and how we go through and interpret these, these dummies here. Okay. So uh, but now let's say I want to go through and I want to uh, account for GPA, right? Because I know that there are probably differences in some degree programs, so the GPAs mean more than other programs, so I want to go through and I want to control for uh, differences, uh, controlling for uh, GPA. So what I do is I uh, rest starting salary on my engineering dummy, my business dummy, uh, and my centered GPA variable. Okay, this is the equation I get. Coefficients, uh, my intercept here, this is my mean salary for liberal arts, when GPA is equal to zero, Layla, what does it mean when GPA is equal to zero? Yeah, when it's held constant at what? At the zero. But what what is what is center G? What is zero represent in center GPA? Mean values. Okay. This is the mean salary for my liberal arts folks at average levels of GPA, at average GPA. Uh, B1 is still, again, my difference in mean salary for engineering versus uh, liberal arts. Controlling for GPA, this is the difference in mean salary for business versus liberal arts. Controlling for GPA, and then uh, my coefficient here, this is my expected change in, uh, my change in expected starting salary per new unit change in uh, GPA for liberal arts. I mean, why is it for liberal arts? Exactly. Right. Liberal, liberal arts is my reference value, right? Uh, this is uh, my expected value or my uh, relation of GPA with outcome holding everything constant at zero. If I'm holding everything constant at zero, that means zero for my business dummy, zero for my English, uh, my engineering dummy, which means I'm talking about people in, who have a liberal arts degree, okay? People seeing how this is, I mean, we keep going through this stuff, but people kind of seeing how this stuff links together, okay? And so here, if I go through and I uh, take a look at this, I see here's uh, the relation between GPA uh, and salary for individuals with an engineering degree, uh, a business degree, and my liberal arts degree. Kate, what do you notice about this graph here? Um, 
that SGPA goes up for each of these, um, the salary does as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, so uh, as GPA increases, starting salary increases for each group, but it's the same for each group. Would we, are we surprised by that, given the model that we run? No, right? Because based on this, we do, this is just an additive model, right? Uh, based on the way we've constructed this, the effect of GPA, the unique effect of GPA on starting salary is independent of these other two, right? So it doesn't matter who we're talking about, this model is estimating the expected increase in starting salary, sort of irrespective of what's going on. And so what we might want to know is whether or not uh, we have any multiplicative effects, whether or not a uh, degree program makes a difference in the association between starting salary and, uh, and GPA, right? So does GPA, does college GPA hold a different relation with starting salary depending on whether or not I'm a liberal arts major, an engineering major, a business major, okay? And we can't test that in an additive model, but we can test it in an interactive model, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to regress starting salary onto my engineering dummy, onto my business dummy, onto my center GPA, okay? Then I'm going to create an interaction of my engineering dummy and center GPA and my business dummy and center GPA, okay? Look me in the eyes. Do not attempt to center your dummy codes. Don't, don't do that. So the whole idea of the dummy code is that there's sort of zero, one, don't try and center your dummy codes uh, in so with a categorical model, okay? So again, uh, engineering dummy, business dummy, GPA, my interaction of uh, engineering and GPA, my interaction of business and GPA. If I run this out, this is my regression model that I get, right? Um, Haley, tell me what, let's say that I get a significant interaction of engineering and GPA. What does that tell me? something else. oh wait GPA and engineering what's that so as GPA increases salary for okay just, just let's, let's do like just keep it a, a general interpretation I'm telling you you don't you don't know what this coefficient is I just say you have a significant interaction of my of GPA and my engineering dummy what does that mean there's a unique association of GPA in relation to starting salary. I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. Anybody, anybody want to take a crack at it? Yeah. Is it the association between GPA and starting salaries degree, yeah, but more specific than this. You're, you're almost there. What's that? On engineering degree? Versus? Versus liberal arts or business? Nope. Okay. Because this is taking just liberal arts. liberal arts, right? The way we've coded this, right? Basically what this interaction term is, it's saying that uh, GPA holds, the, the relation between GPA and starting salary differs for individuals uh, for engineers versus liberal arts majors, right? And my interaction here tells me that the relation between, if this is statistically significant, it tells me that the relation between GPA and uh, eventual salary differs from, is always the comparison group, right? Um, now, when we control it, when we create our dummies, we have zero values for uh, both people with liberal arts degrees and engineering degrees for this dummy, and this is the combination of liberal arts and engineering for, or this is a combination of liberal arts and business for this code, uh, a combination of liberal arts uh, and engineering for the business dummy. But with both of those in the model, if one is zero, if both of these are zero, holding everything else constant at zero, if both of these are zero, then we're just talking about liberal arts folks, right? So again, wanting to think carefully about what do these interaction terms mean from a conceptual standpoint, right? Here, means that uh, GPA, the association between GPA and starting salary differs across engineers and liberal arts majors. Here, the, the relation between uh, GPA and starting salary differs across individuals with business and liberal arts. Okay. 
And so if we go through and take a look, my simple slope uh, for, uh, and what's nice about these uh, categorical models is the simple slopes start to fall out much easier with this. So we see here, uh, this is my, the simple slopes for uh, my liberal arts is just uh, 2982 plus GPA. Uh, John, help me understand how I got this is my simple slopes for my liberal arts groups. Yeah, yeah, because if I'm holding everything out, if this is, so this is just my association between GPA, this is just my coefficient here, right? But if this is the association between GPA and starting salary, holding everything else constant at zero, well, that means someone's zero in engineering, zero business, and then zero here and zero here, everything else kind of falls out. And basically, I'm just talking about people who are in liberal arts, right? So this is my simple slope for individuals who are uh, liberal arts majors, uh, for engineering majors, right? Easy to calculate my simple slopes. I've got my intercept plus one for engineering, right? So it gives me 70, uh, 65 plus my coefficient for GPA uh, minus 677, one for engineering times GPA, business is zero, that goes away, right? And so I'm left with sort of, sort of, uh, sort of run this together, uh, 28,047 plus 123, uh, seven GPA. Same thing for business, I just can easily go through and drop zeros for everything else, one for business, drop it down. This is my simple slope for business, right? Um, and so what I end up with is, uh, my intercept here is going to be my mean salary, my expected salary for liberal arts majors with GPA held constant at zero, or GPA, GPA held constant at the mean. Okay. Uh, my coefficient here for B1, this is the difference in mean salary for engineering versus uh, liberal arts with GPA equal to zero, right? Uh, this is um, my second, this is a G difference in mean salary between business and liberal arts with GPA held constant at zero. Uh, B3, uh, this is my expected salary uh, per unit change in GPA uh, for liberal arts majors. Now these are all asterisk because in the presence of a significant interaction, these are all conditional effects, right? And so these will change if we start to change salary or GPA or things along those lines. So we want to remember that. But combination of uh, B3 and B4 is going to be association between GPA and salary for engineers. B3 and B5, association between GPA and salary for business. So this all ends up turning out to look a lot like a basic logic puzzle, right? You can want to go through, fit the pieces and parts in, but if you're thinking carefully about what these different things mean, you'll be good to go. Okay. So, uh, again, uh, if I want a, a, a test of my simple slopes, right? So we can go through and we can get these just like before. We can factor these out, plot out my simple slopes for GPA for each one of these different uh, different groups. Um, but if I want to get a test to see if these simple slopes are statistically significant, I need to go through and run some models, right? Uh, so my simple slopes for uh, liberal arts, this is just this right here. I already have my simple slope for liberal arts, right? This is just telling me the relation between GPA and starting salary for my liberal arts group. So we already have that, right? But if I want to get uh, my simple slope for engineering, also pretty easy. All I need to do is I just uh, go through and I create a new dummy code for my liberal arts, where I have one if it's a liberal arts, zero if it's engineering or business, uh, a recode uh, for my business dummy, where it's one if it's business and zero if it's engineering and liberal arts. And so now all of a sudden engineering is my, uh, is my base category. And then I just rerun my model with appropriate interaction terms and things like that. And then the coefficient for GPA is now a simple slope for engineer. Because engineer is now my base category, right? Same thing for business. 
do the same thing. I keep my uh, dummy for uh, liberal arts. I make a new dummy for engineering where one is engineering, zero is business or liberal arts. And then I just run the analysis again into whatever the coefficient is for GPA. That's not my simple solve for uh, engineering. Right? And if you go through and you take a look and you run these models and you recode your dummies and do that, these are the values that you should get for each one of these, right? This is why uh, factoring these uh, models out is, is important and useful, because it provides a check on how you're going through and run your analyses, right? And so again, if we go through and take a look at this, uh, we get our uh, coefficient for uh, liberal arts, we get our simple slopes for business, we get our simple slopes for engineering, right? Um, Kate, tell me what you're seeing. How do I, how do I interpret and make, make sense of what's going on in this uh, in this graph? Uh, well, for both liberal arts and business, but more so for business, you have so like the sorry, um, the interaction between like GPA and salary depends more on degree for like business and liberal arts. Close. Not the interaction, just just the just the unique uh, unique effect, right? Okay. So we're saying, based on this, without sort of running these, right? It looks as though that if I'm talking about business majors or liberal arts majors, it looks like we do have a relation between GPA and starting salary, in which as GPA increases, people's starting salary gets bigger, right? But Within the context of this interaction, it looks like that's more of an issue for individuals in business than it is for liberal arts. For engineers, and if you, I don't know, we have friends who are engineers or sort of have done so. Sees the eight degrees, man, it doesn't matter. If you sort of make it through, no one cares what you got. If you passed it, you're good. Here we see very little association between uh, uh, GPA and outcome. Uh, in that just as long as you get the your degree, you're, you're good to go, right? And so again, this is important as you're working through examples, wanting you to think about like, so what does this mean, right? Not just telling me, yep, there's a significant relation, and this is what it is. Wanting to just go through and say, this association looks stronger, it's in the opposite direction. Uh, so as this increases, the uh, uh, association between this and that decreases. So sort of whatever that looks like, you want to think carefully about uh, what's going on with this. Okay. All right. People feeling okay with the introduction to some of this here? All right, cool. All right, one thing to just want to think about in terms of uh, some conceptual stuff. Um, if you find a significant interaction effect, particularly when your predictor and your moderator are highly correlated, what you want to make sure is that you're looking at an actual interaction effect and not some sort of masked quadratic effect. Okay. Because if I have, let's say, x is negative affect and m is neuroticism, right? And I want to see if neuroticism moderates the relation between negative affect and something else, right? If my neuroticism and my negative affect measures are basically collinear with one another, and I find that I had to get a significant interaction effect, I want to make sure that what I'm not actually got is, a, is, a, is actually just a quadratic effect of neuroticism, right? Is neuroticism, and we think about what that might look like. Ah, okay. If I'm looking at at neuroticism and academic performance, right? If I'm super, super low on neuroticism, shiftless hippie and not doing anything, that's probably not good. If I hit here, some level of neuroticism means I'm sort of attending this stuff, but then if I get too much, then things start to drop down, right? I apologize if anybody smart shiftless hippies. <laughs> uh, but so the concern here is 
is that what I might have is an actual quadratic uh, uh, relation between neuroticism and, and, and academic functioning. Uh, and if I take two, if I take neuroticism and multiply it by uh, negative affect or something like that, what am I might say is, oh, like this is a moderation effect, when in fact it's not. It's, it's just, it's a, uh, what that does is it's just masking what's actually just a curvilinear effect of my one thing there. And so, uh, again, um, Aiken and West, does anybody, be honest with me, anybody read any of the Aiken and West showers? Probably not. Okay, that's fine. It's just tough. It's a thin book, but it's, but it's very, very, very good. And if you go through, it will be helpful in solidifying some of this stuff, particularly if you go on and have moderation types of analyses. Uh, Aiken and West go through, talk about methods for going through and testing whether or not uh, your stuff is maybe better captured with uh, a quadratic or a sort of multiplicative model, or a, excuse me, a um, exponential model as opposed to interaction terms, okay? Um, just be very careful if your moderator and your, uh, and your X variable are highly, highly correlated. And if you're doing proper screening with your data, you should catch this anyway. I just want to know that this is, this is something that can go on, okay? Um, and again, whether or not this is better modeled as a, as a curve linear function or as a moderation effect, this is going to be based on sort of your understanding of the literature and sort of theory and things along those lines. All right, I want to uh, finish up this stuff with uh, some discussion about effect sizes, power, uh, reliability, some confidence in all types of stuff here. Um, again, uh, as we all know, hopefully at this point, if we're talking about effect size, we're just talking about the magnitude uh, of an association of the population. We can also think about this as the extent to which our null hypothesis is false. And our null hypothesis is always false from a theoretical standpoint. The null hypothesis can never be true because the association is never going to be exactly zero. We think about effect sizes as the extent to which it's not zero or, or the, the null is false. As we go through, uh, we talk through about different types of effect size, and one of the things that gets tricky uh, with regression is there's a lot of different effect sizes that you could use depending on what coefficients that you wanted to capture. Okay. Uh, as a refresher, remember we were talking about power. This is a long-term probability of rejecting the null hypothesis uh, determined by our effect size, alpha levels, uh, sample size are sort of what we're sort of hoping for in terms of power. Um, uh, if we our uh, analyses are underpowered, what we do is we we risk failing to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. There's an effect in there. There's a population effect. We just didn't capture it because we don't have enough power in our, uh, in our analyses to, uh, to get there, okay? And the thing to remember is our moderation analyses notoriously underpowered, okay? Our interactions, the interaction terms, the, sort of the, our, the thing that we're hunting is often quite small. Uh, and then uh, measurement error, poor reliability of our measures, this compounds this issue exponentially. And so these can be very, very, very difficult uh, effects to detect. Okay? and often require quite large samples. Uh, and so important to remember as you're going through the thing. One thing you don't want to do is come into a, into a uh, committee meeting and say, oh, I'm assuming that I'm looking for a medium effect size based on hopes and dreams, I guess, right? Uh, that's not a reasonable basis for sort of much of anything. I don't know, I'm on like two committees. <laughs> it's just, like, like destroyed your mind, you're like, oh, no. Uh, but again, wanted to go through and take a close look and think about, so what are my measures, how have I built my model, uh, particularly if you're going to be using some of these regression analyses, okay? So we're talking about our effect sizes in our multiple regression models. Uh, if we're thinking about our lower order interactive effects, our coefficients, a number of different ways we can conceptualize the magnitude of effect, okay? Um, if we're talking about, and so this notation is just going to be helpful. So. So bear with me with this. If we're looking at R squared Y given AB, okay, uh, we're going to talk about this as our proportion of variability in our outcome attributable to the best combination of our full set of predictors. Okay, so we're thinking about we're thinking about this in terms of a hierarchical model where A is the first set of variable uh, predictors, B is the second set of predictors. Okay, uh, so think about this as your R squared value. Okay. 
uh, if we're, and for a moderation uh, analysis, if we want to structure this uh, as a hierarchical model, we might take all our first order or lower term effects as sort of the first and then our terms of putting our interaction layer in our interaction terms uh, in the second set of model or something like that, right? So R, uh, R squared for Y, uh, for given A and B, is just our total variability in the model, okay? So again, if total variability in Y, this is the total variability in Y that's being accounted for A, B, and C, right? This is like our R squared for the full model, okay? We can also start thinking about uh, R squared uh, given A. When we think about this as a proportion of variability in our outcome uh, attributable to the best uh, linear combination of predictors just in set A, okay? Um, and again, if we're thinking about this in terms of a moderation model, uh, we might think about this as uh, uh, the proportion of variability in Y that's attributable to just our first order effects, you know, without the inclusion of, without the inclusion of any, any uh, interaction terms. So in this case, this would be everything in Y that's accounted for both sort of A and B, right? Because B is, uh, set B is not included in, in, the, in the model yet. Uh, to, with what we're doing, okay? So here what we're doing is just thinking about, here's, I've structured these, mod, these, these predictors, so set A is just sort of the first set of uh, variables that I'm putting in the model, set B is the next set of, vari uh, of the predictors, right? So if we're talking about our uh, example here, uh, pain, opiate use, and PTSD, that's going in set A, interaction of opiate use and pain, and the interaction of pain and PTSD, that's going in set B. So here, this is the uh, R squared for the full model with all the variables in it. R squared given A, this is just the, uh, or the R squared for the model with just my first order effects. Okay. Uh, if we want to then start sort of breaking things out, and we can talk about this in terms of individual predictors or sets of predictors. Um, we can talk about uh, R squared for Y, sort of uh, given uh, for B given A, sort of in these little parentheses right here, okay? What we're talking about here, or we'll be looking at here, the proportion of total variability in Y that's unique to set B, okay? Um, within the context, so if we're sort of looking in our model here, uh, R squared uh, for B given A is just going to be this section right here. It's just the stuff that's unique to set A after we parcel out stuff for uh, set B. So of all the variability in Y, what's unique to uh, set A in our predictors? Okay. Um, or excuse me, uh, what's unique to set B? So after we parcel out set A and we add set B into the mix, what's unique to set B? So if we have our interaction of PTSD and pain and opiate use and pain, what proportion of the total variability in our outcome is unique to that combination, uh, to those two interaction terms, okay? And so, in our hierarchical model that we've been talking about, our R squared for Y, uh, for B given A, this is like our R squared change, right? Because if our first, uh, in our first step, we've got our first order effects, and we throw our interactions into our second step, this is just going to tell us our R squared change, right? What's how much additional variability in Y is being accounted for by the addition of these two interaction terms? Do okay, people follow? R squared for Y uh, given B or for B given A, this is equal to my squared semi-partial for that one variable. Okay, so if I'm thinking about Instead of uh, set B doesn't have sort of a number of variables, if it's just got one predictor, my uh, squared semi-partial correlation is basically like an R squared change. You can think of it that way. Uh, what's the proportion of unique variability that's accounted for uniquely to this variable, right? What does this variable, or what does this predictor add above and beyond what's already in the model? So this is kind of like our squared semi-partial correlation. And so, if we want to calculate uh, sort of mathematically, so R, uh, R squared for Y 
uh, R squared Y for B given A. This is basically like taking our R squared for the full model and subtracting out our uh, R squared that's attributable to our first set of predictors. Right? It's pretty simple, right? Uh, so what has B set B added? Whether set B is a set of variables or just a single variable, what has this contributed to our overall R squared? Or sort of what has this contributed? Well, if we just take our total R squared for our full model and subtract the set that's got everything else, what we're left with is what this is this uh, squared set on partial for this set of predictors. People following me on this. Let me know because it is going to start to get be crazy here. Okay. Other thing we can take a look at, sort of slightly different notation. R squared for YB given A. We talk about this as notation for the proportion of residual variability in Y that's unique to set B. Okay. Um, if we're talking about set B only contains one predictor, this is a equivalent to our squared partial correlation. Okay. So here what we're doing is we're saying, here's set B. If we go through and we partial out all of this stuff attributable to set A, kind of move that aside, of everything that's left, Of that, what's unique to B? Right? This is going to be our uh, our squared partial correlation. Okay. Now, if our set B only has one predictor, then it's just my squared partial correlation. If I have multiple predictors in the set, then it's sort of like a multiple partial correlation here. Okay. And so uh, I can calculate my partial coefficient here for Y B given A by taking my Overall R squared, this is R squared for my whole model. Subtracting uh, from that variability that's attributable to sort of the, the stuff that's in set Y over the top of one minus everything that's accounted for by set Y, right? And just give me sort of the rest of the stuff here. Okay. So you see that the numerator is the same, right? Uh, except this just has this denominator. So I'm going to uh, and talking about it. so, Laura, which one of these, which one of these, very, which one of these uh, coefficients is going to be generally going to be larger? Yeah, right. This is the total piece of the pie. This is just everything over the top of everything. This is what's unique to the set B. This is unique uh, over everything. This is what's unique to set B. After we just take out sort of all the stuff that's left to set uh, that was everything that's left over after A. So this is like our semi-partial correlation. This is like our partial correlation, right? So this is your variable, your variability in your set. So you're looking at, this is total variability. This is variability remaining in it, uh, after we pull out stuff for set A. You also have an F squared statistic. F squared statistic is a formal metric of FX size, right? If you're doing proper power analyses, you often see F squared. Uh, this is taking, again, the same thing. We're taking uh, variability uh, that's unique to set B. But this time, what we're doing is we're taking 1 minus R squared uh, minus AB. So this is basically the denominator here. If our partial is everything after we section out uh, uh, set A, Our F is just looking at anything that's left over. This is just basically looking at our error, right? This is the stuff that's uh, remaining after we set o uh, after we account for set both sets A and B. Right? So our F squared is taking the stuff that's unique to set B over just our error, right? Because this is the stuff that's not accounted for. My partial correlation. Is the stuff that's unique to set B over everything that's left over after we pull out A. Uh, and my semi-partial is going to be stuff that's unique to set B out of the whole mess of things. Okay. People seeing sort of where this is, how, how we're going through. So again, numerator is the same. In each one of these, no matter what effect size we're talking about, we're talking about uh, variability that's unique to set B, whether or not set B is a, a number of predictors or just a single predictor. 
it's just the denominator just starts to change uh, in terms of what we're uh, what we're looking at here. Questions on this? Okay. So what we can do is then we can go through and start creating confidence intervals around some of these different effect sizes. Um, so as we know, uh, calculation of our, our uh, confidence interval uh, requires us to get some non-centrality parameter. And if we're working with SPSS, SPSS won't give us this non-centrality parameter. We have to go through and we need to use some different uh, tools to go through and, and capture that. But given all the stuff that we did last year, uh, or last, uh, oh, yeah, last year, last semester, um, this is actually not too difficult. It'll be pretty familiar. If we go through and we grab your Steiger calculator, right, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to get your non-centrality parameter uh, by taking your F value for your overall R squared, dropping that in there, degrees of freedom, 95% confidence interval, right, um, and this is going to give you your upper and lower limits for your non-centrality parameter for R squared. Um, R squared lower is just your non-centrality parameter lower over the top of your non-centrality parameter plus U plus V plus 1. U is just your number of predictors or the degrees of freedom numerator. V is uh, sample size minus the number of predictors minus 1 or degrees of freedom in your denominator and 1 is just to the 1. Um, and that will give us our upper and lowers, right? And so then what we do is then we can just get our point, we've got a point estimate for R squared, and then we can just go through and calculate our upper and lower bounds based on the value we can get from our non-centrality parameter. Okay. We also know that our model R squared holds a direct uh, relation with F squared. Uh, F squared is equal to R squared over one minus R squared. Uh, and so what we can do is we can actually uh, calculate upper and lower bounds for F squared by just using this equation to take, once I get my upper and lower bound for R squared, and you just plug those in, get upper and lower bounds for F squared, and start moving back and forth with this stuff. So, one thing to know, uh, and this gets into the technical issues, um, this procedure is assuming uh, that we're using a fixed effects model. Do we ever use a fixed effects model in practice? No, this is always one of these things that we always violate unless we're an experimental study, unless we're running an experimental study within the context of a regression framework where we've gone through and everything is is uh, uh, appropriately randomized and things along those lines. But generally, we're not running fixed effects models in our correlation analyses. This works and is technically correct for fixed effects, but if we're not running fixed effects, we can think about this as an approximation. Okay. So, what would this look like in terms of our actual sort of running? Let's say we've got, uh, we've run our model, what do we got? Okay, we've got, uh, we're regressing quality of life onto each one of our uh, uh, PTSD clusters. You guys were playing around with these data uh, in the out there in your uh, past problem set. Uh, so here is our R squared value, 0.146. And so what we want to do is we want to get a, a confidence in the world around that. So, I go through and I pull up my uh, Steiger calculator here, and I say I'm uh, looking for an F distribution. My F test for my model R squared is 11.84. Drop that there. Degrees of freedom numerator, four. Degrees of freedom denominator, 28278. 95% confidence interval, run that. My upper and lower bounds here, okay? Then all it is is just back substituting in R squared lower, 20.828. So going through and running that gives me my lower bound for R squared. Do the same thing with my upper bound, gives me my upper bound. And so my uh, confidence interval around R squared, 0.146. 95% confidence interval, 0.069, uh, 0.212. Okay. We'll see how it's, it's pretty easy to go through the thing with this one. Okay. And so just as an example of how we might to interpret this, right, we might say, uh, best linear combination of re-experiencing avoidance, hyperarousal, and numbing symptoms expected to account for between 6.9 and 21.2% of the variability uh, in reported quality of life with population of community members exposed to serious more trauma. Right? So any of the interpretation is easy. You guys got this handled. It's the same kind of just general framework. We're just going through and, and making adjustments there. Okay. 
you'll see how we sort of have gone through an SPSS and gotten sort of our upper and lower limits for R squared. Okay. State is easier. <laughs> you just go through uh, and you run your regression model and then you set E stat E size and it'll give you your, this is your model here, this is your R squared value and then your 95% confidence interval around it. It's nice just sort of go through and, and do that. You don't have to worry about stacking your stuff. So, what about if we want to calculate a confidence interval around R squared? Okay, so let's say that we have included our first order effects in the first step of our model, and then included our interaction terms in the second step of the model, and we get an R squared value for the proportion, so how much, what additional variability is accounted for in our outcome with the inclusion of these uh, interaction effects? get an R squared value and then we want to go through and we want to calculate the confidence interval around that. Okay. Um, now what ends up happening is remember our R squared change is similar to what uh, correlation that we talked about? Our R squared change is kind of like our, uh, is sort of an analog or equivalent uh, to R squared semi-partial correlation, right? Um, but uh, in order to get a estimation around our sort of our R squared change, which is kind of like a squared semi-partial correlation, right? It's proportion of variability unique to this set of predictors relative to the whole all the variability in, in Y. What we need to do is we need to get an interval estimate around our partial effect, right? Um, and so what we can do to get our partial effect is if we take our partial effect is going to be, we can derive this from our R squared for our full model minus the R squared value for uh, the variables, uh, uh, for variables in the first step. Divide that over one minus R squared for variables in the first step, right? Because again, remember uh, uh, R squared YB given A, this is like our partial correlation. This is it's asking what uh, the proportion of vari uh, residual variability that you need to be, or not the whole piece of the pie, it's just the stuff that's left over after we section out uh, stuff in, in part A here, in set A. Um, so we can take this as our R squared for our full model, minus R squared for our first step, over the top of one minus R squared for our first step. Or we can think about this as R, uh, R squared for our semi-partial effect, or our R squared change, right, over one minus R squared for the first step. So if we take the full model and subtract uh, our R squared for the full model, and we subtract the stuff that's accounted that was captured in the first set of predictors, what are we left with? R squared change, right? So we go through and we do that. Uh, we can also uh, calculate our F squared here. Our F squared uh, is gonna be our, uh, uh, our partial coefficient over one minus R squared for the full model, right? So this is the stuff that's unique to B over sort of everything that's left over after, so basically your error uh, variability here, right? Um, and so what we can do is we can go through and get the upper bound and lower bound of our non-centrality parameter uh, of our uh, R squared change based on our F test here, and then just use this we go through and we get an upper and lower bound for our partial coefficient using this. And then once we've got the upper and lower bound for our partial coefficient, then we can take that, back translate that into upper and lower bounds for our R squared change. So there's a couple of different steps we have to go through. We want to get a, a confidence interval around R squared, which is like our semi-partial, or R squared change, which is like our semi-partial correlation. In order to get that, we first have to get our partial correlation. We can get upper and lower bounds for partial correlation and then take that and translate those back into upper and lower bounds for our squared change. Okay. So if we go through, let's say, um, in this model, in this uh, set that you all were playing around with, in our first step, we have uh, avoidance that we've regressed um, our quality of life indicator on avoidance and re-experiencing. And in the second step, we 
we've added numbing and hyperarousal onto that. So we've got two variables in the first step, in the first step, two variables in the second step. And what we want to do is we want to calculate uh, a confidence interval around our R squared change value. Right? What's the uh, what's the unique contribution of uh, numbing and hyperarousal to predicting variability in my outcome? Well, my R squared change here is 6.3 percent. Right? So. Uh, my, uh, the addition of numbing and hyperarousal has contributed an additional 6.3% of the total variability of my outcome. Here's my R squared uh, for the full model. Here's my R squared for uh, portion A. Laura, if I take 1.46 and I just subtract 0 0.082, what do I get? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's just sort of, this minus this gives us my R squared change, right? So uh, what we can do is I can take my, uh, if I want to get my partial coefficient, because I need to get point S, I need to get my partial coefficient so I can calculate the confidence in a world around that. So I take my R squared for my, my, my full model, 0.146, and subtract my R squared uh, for set A, right? That's 0.082. I sub, uh, take that over the top of 1 minus R squared for set A, 0 0.082, gives me uh, a coefficient of 0 0.070. Okay. I could have also just taken 0 0.063 and divided by that because it's the same thing, but so we go take it the long way, right? And then if I go through and I take a uh, look at uh, my non centrality parameter for F for 2. And uh, oh, that's wrong. Oh no, it's not. Okay, my uh, or, uh, my um, non centrality parameters uh, for an F statistic with ten point my F is ten point seven uh, ten point two seven with two and two hundred seventy eight degrees of freedom. This is my F test for my R squared change. Right. This is going to give me my upper and lower bounds for uh, my uh, partial correlation. And so I get my upper and lower bounds for my non-centrality parameter, 5.659, 41.369. Use those, plug those in to get my upper and lower bounds for my point estimate and my partial coefficient here. So my uh, confidence interval for my partial coefficient, my point estimate, 0 0.070. Lower bound 0 .07, uh, 0 0.020, upper bound 0 0.128. Okay. John, is this, a co is this a confidence interval I want to get? What I'm looking for? Is this my R, chart? Is this my, uh, R squared change? Nope, this is my partial, right? Because remember, we've got to get confidence interval around my partial in order to get to my semi partial, which is like my R squared change here. Uh, and so what I need to do now is now I can go through and I can take my upper and lower bound around my confidence interval for my partial and back translate those into upper and lower bound for my R squared change. So what I can do, remember that uh, my semi partial is going to be my partial times one minus R squared for whatever was accounted for in set Y or in set A. So I take my lower bound. 0 0.020, multiply that by 1 minus 0 0.082, gives me 0.018. My upper bound, 0.128, times 1 minus 0.082, so is my upper bound here. Okay. So again, if you were ever in a situation where you wanted to say, my variables of interest, like something that's unique, Evelyn is looking at, so new predictors of eating pathology or something like that, and you're saying this combination of predictors is doing a it's going above and beyond sort of, the, sort of the standard stuff. This is accounting for additional variability in my outcome. Here's my R squared change and my sort of confidence interval around that is sort of this to this, right? So we would say that this, uh, this set of predictors is accounting for, for anywhere from uh, anywhere from about two to 12% additional variability above and beyond sort of the stuff that's so we already sort of know and think about. Questions? So, if we want to 
then use this to start looking at confidence intervals around squared partial correlations or squared semi-partial correlations. Basically, we're using the same steps as we did previously. It's just instead of, in this time, instead of having a set of predictors um, uh, in sort of my last set, it's just an individual predictor that I can go through and, and take a look at, okay? So again, uh, we know that my squared semi-partial correlation is equal to the, my uh, model R squared for my full model minus whatever was captured in set A. And in this case, we're gonna say set A is, ca is including all the predictors aside from the one that we're interested in. Okay. Uh, our squared partial correlations, um, here we've got, again, uh, my uh, full model minus set A over the top of one minus R squared for set A, or just my squared semi-partial over one minus R squared for set A, again, so we're getting the residual variability, the stuff that's left over after we account for set A. Uh, just like before, we're going to use our F test from our R squared change to go through and uh, sort of manipulate this. Our uh, partial correlation continues to have a relation with my semi partial. So we're basically going through the same process as we did previously, this time with just one uh, predictor in set B. Right? So if we go through, let's say that here in this situation, we've got, uh, I'm wanting to look at. Uh, I want to calculate confidence interval around my squared semi-partial correlation for emotional numbing. Okay, so my squared partial correlation, my squared semi-partial correlation, is telling me the uh, portion of total variability in, in my outcome that's unique to numbing after I control for everything else. Right. So um, my squared partial correlation is 0 0.06. Right. So if I take my partial correlation, I square that. I get 0 0.06 here. Uh, and then what I do, if I can go through and I can take uh, the non-centrality parameter for my F test. So this is in my first step of the model, I have uh, hyperarousal avoidance and re-experiencing. And in the second step, I add numbing, right? Uh, and so I can take my uh, F statistic for my R squared change. R squared change is 0.054. Anywhere else could I get 0.054? Um, you could just subtract your step B R squared from, or step A R squared from your step B R squared. Yep, I could do that. Where else could I get it? Where's the calculator? Take 0.232 and square that. 0.054? Yeah, right. Again, this is just my squared semi-partial correlation, right? Uh, my squared semi-partial correlation is telling me the proportion of uh, variability uh, that's unique to this predictor. It's basically, it's just my R squared change value right here, right? So we can take, uh, but for this, we need to have this F, because uh, in SPSS, we need to get uh, my, uh, my non-centrality parameter. So I take my F squared, uh, my F statistic for my R squared change uh, with one and 278 degrees of freedom, get my upper and lower limits for my non-centrality parameter, and then just I take those and convert those into upper and lower uh, limits for uh, my squared partial correlation, okay? And so I get uh, my squared partial correlation 0 0.060, uh, with a lower bound of 0 0.017, 0 0.120. And then, what I know is my squared semi-partial correlation, 0 0.232, is 0 0.054, or the same thing we've got up there. And what I can do is I can then go through and take uh, my upper and lower limits of my partial, uh, of confidence interval for my partial correlation, and I can back translate those into upper and lower for my semi-partial correlation, and so then I've got uh, my squared semi-partial correlation or uh, the proportion of variability and quality of life that's unique to, total, the proportion of total variability and quality of life that's unique to emotional numbing is 0.054 with lower bounds 0.015, upper bound 0.0, uh, 0.109, okay? So the idea with um, 
SPSS is that we need to, in order to get upper and lower bounds for our effect sizes, we need to have non-centrality parameters. And to get our non-centrality parameter uh, with our Steiger calculator, calculator, we need to have F statistics, or we need to have test statistics to get upper and lower bounds. There are some shortcuts that I'm not going to get into, but if you're clever, you can probably sort of test this out. I'm going to eventually have you sort of put together a calculator for this. Um, but in SPSS, this is a way to go through and get upper and lower bounds for uh, for some of these things. Okay. Questions here. Okay. So it's not really all that difficult. It's just knowing sort of where to grab your values and so going through and making sure you've got the right stuff. Okay. Um, what's nice in Stata, again, is we can use some of the stuff that uh, it's giving us already. Uh, so if I uh, regress quality of life onto my, uh, my four predictors, I get an R squared value here. My uh, effect size is giving me uh, here. Remember we talked about east at east size, Layla is giving me uh, my R squared value and then the confidence interval around that. This, uh, these are my squared partial correlations and my confidence intervals around my squared partial correlations. So this is already, so we're getting to the point you don't have to go through and uh, worry about uh, the st uh, Steiger calculator, you're already, you're already starting with confidence intervals around your squared partial correlations. Um, here are your uh, pairwise, or your, uh, um, uh, uh, your effect size of your part and partial correlations, similar partial correlations here. So if we think that uh, our squared, so our squared semi-partial correlation is equal to our partial correlation times one minus uh, uh, R squared for our first set, Right. You can say we already have a uh, confidence interval around the partial correlation, right? So for numbing, it's 0.059. Here's lower, here's upper. So we got that already. Right. We know my uh, squared semi-partial correlation is 0.05. Where is it? No, down here. Squared semi-partial correlation 0.054. And so we know that my R squared for uh, set Y is going to be my R squared for my full model minus sort of my part R squared for that one variable gives me 0 0.092. And then we can just go through and sort of jump through there. So we don't need to worry about the staggered calculator and things like that. So this, while not relevant to necessarily all of you people have seen, kind of where I'm pulling these va values from and why sort of this all works together. Okay, it's just nice to be able to see how this stuff fits together. You see the, the, the matrix and know kind of where they are going from here. All right, questions on any of this stuff? How are we feeling? Okay. Um, uh, the, I'll go through and post, um, uh, go through and make sure that our next problem set is, is posted. So I'll have you do, I'll restrict this one to sort of one screen. I'll have you screen sort of one of these data sets and not have to worry about the other. So have you one screening um, and I think we can limit it to two sets that you're actually working with data and one that's sort of doing sort of second ana and analysis of, of some things. Um, this uh, moderation set will be due not obviously this coming Friday, long Friday. Um, so make sure you get an early start on this because these moderation analyses are tricky. I'll be post up uh, a walkthrough, a screencast demo of a uh, moderation, uh, moderation analysis that I ran with some different data. I'll create a screencast that walks us through these data so you can go through and map on and make sure everything uh, gets put together. Um, if you have questions, uh, come talk to Angela and come talk to me. Make sure that you're on the right track with stuff. This one is going to be, this one can get frustrating when things don't add up correctly. So just make sure you're being careful. I would say number one thing to do is make sure on your when you're factoring things out, signs will kill you on this stuff. So if you get a negative where you should have positive, positive where you should have negative, it'll throw everything off. So just be very, very careful as you're walking through this stuff. Angela, do you have any other?